Church for the first Sunday after Trinity. Our liturgy shall be on page 235, Morning Prayer, following our opening hymn, hymn 936.
verses 12 through 22 in unison.
of these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me, for I continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. O Lord, have mercy on us. The second reading comes from 1 John chapter 4. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The third reading comes from Luke chapter 16. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died, and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who have passed from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. O Lord, have mercy on us. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. In the name of Jesus, amen. Jesus loves you. How many times have you heard that comforting phrase, that theological truth? 
Do you remember how Dr. Oswald Hoffman pronounced it on the Lutheran Hour? It's one of my memories. Jesus loves you. He sounded happily grumpy. And I never understood why Dr. Hoffman said Jesus loves you the way that he did all those years on the radio until I learned German in college. Jesus liebe dich! Wow, that was harsh. But that's German for Jesus loves you. I'm not picking on the Germans or the German language. Everybody gets used to the cadence and the communication of their own relationships. Sometimes all we need to know from dad or mom that they love us is that one little wink, that one little nod, that bit of encouragement. But love is confusing. I'm not talking about romantic love, for once. I'm talking about love theologically as we have in the scriptures. Perhaps you remember from catechism classes that love is the fulfillment of the law. Indeed it is. The first table, love God. The second table of the law, love your neighbor. But too often, we assume, we perceive that love is rude. Because love says, do. Love says, don't. Love tells us what to do. There's plenty of law in love, especially when moms get involved. Tell your sister you're sorry. I can tell my sister I'm sorry, but I don't have to mean it, Mom. Ouch. The law does this. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. It goes for sisters too. This is law. It's a reminder that when it comes to love of God and love of neighbor, you need both. If you don't love neighbor, John here says, you can't truly love God. Didn't Jesus say the same thing? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So where does Jesus' love for us fit into this whole dynamic? Well, rather simply put, that's the gospel. Jesus loves you is what he does for you. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. No wonder this is a lesson chosen for the Sunday after Trinity. We have all three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit active for us, for our salvation, for our edification, for our sanctification. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. There it is, the gospel. But not just the Savior of the world, as if we were to talk about the gospel. The Lord Jesus is your Savior. And he does the job. He does the complete job. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. This is the good confession that we make. Whether we're confessing Jesus is Lord, as the ancient church did, the Apostles' Creed as new Christians in Rome learned it in the catacombs. We believe 
as the Nicene Creed was originally written, or if we with joy confess the Athanasian Creed as we have. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. It is as Jesus wanted that we may go and bear fruit, fruit that lasts in Jesus, the vine. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. That's the message of Christianity. That's the primary, the unique message that no civil law ordinance based government has, no other world religion has, that the Savior, Son of God, God Himself has done the work of saving you and delivering the gift to you. We have come to know this from the scriptures that the Lord has given to us. It has been revealed to us, this love that God has for us. We can enjoy all of the gifts that Wyoming has to offer, hunting, fishing, hiking, but has a bear or a bird ever told you the good news about Jesus? No. Creation out there in a fallen world is a very law-based society, too. You might get too hot. You might get dehydrated. You might spend 14 hours ice fishing and only catch one fish. That's law, but the company made it a very gospel-centered occasion. Whoever abides in love abides in God, we're told. God is love. Isn't that one of the shortest Bible verses we ever memorized? God is love. And he truly is. But his idea of love and our idea of love, they are sometimes in conflict with one another. God's love believes in reconciliation. God's love forgives, and it means that we have a future. We have a future with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all who have died in Christ. We have a future because our relationships are based on reconciliation. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. I had a shut-in visit 11 years ago, right here in Sheridan. And as this lady was learning how to trust me as her new pastor, she finally admitted something. She said, you know how those two-year-olds sometimes take their big fingers and they plug their ears and they go, na 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 Yeah. Back when I was still able to be in church in person, I really wanted to do that. Every time the Lord's Prayer showed up in a service. Oh, really, I said, hoping that she would volunteer more. She said, at that time, I was holding a grudge against a neighbor. She didn't specify, I didn't dig too much more. It wasn't my business. And she said, I was so angry at them. I was angry at Jesus for including that line in the Lord's Prayer. You could still see that the feelings about this situation were visceral. I've forgiven that person now. It was really hard to. And it's still hard every day that I see that person to remember to forgive them and not give them a piece of my mind. But every time it said, forgive us our trespasses, I wanted that, Pastor. But every time it said, as we forgive those who trespass against us, I wanted to be a two-year-old with her fingers in her ears. But the Lord loves me. And love 
means I forgive. I can't forget, that's part of life in this world. But he forgave me, and so I'm trying. He was a very eye-opening visit. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Isn't that the truth? Death, disease, uncertainty, and people not getting along. Doesn't that sound like life in this world? I'm not talking about any situation in particular. Jesus had to put up with people down here. And what was one of his most famous words? A word from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They really didn't putting him up there on the cross, did they? The devil did not know what he was doing in getting Jesus on a cross. It was the mode of his defeat. We need confidence for the day of judgment. We need to have a clear conscience for the day of judgment. We need to be accountable to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we don't, we might be afraid. And fear and faith don't get along very well. Trust me. Really? You really don't like that phrase, do you? I don't either. But we can trust God. We have faith in Him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And the kind of love that Jesus has for you is that perfect love. Nope, we can't measure up to it, again with the law. But Jesus loves you. We have forgiveness for not loving perfectly. Fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So finally, verse 19. We've already talked about 20 and 21, but verse 19 is one of my favorites. It's part of my wedding ceremony. We love because he first loved us. John even says it in the wrong order. Don't you love that? We love, yeah, on a good day. <laughs> A sanctified day? How? Is it my own strength? Is it my own dedication? My own piety? Absolutely not. Pastor, Christian, any one of us. We love because, because why? He first loved us. So let's say it in chronological and theological order. God loved us. God loves you. Therefore, we love one another. We forgive as we have been forgiven. We reconcile as Jesus has reconciled us to the Father. And it's only because of God's love for us that we can return the favor and love God. You know the story. Enemies of God. Naturally running away from him. But in Jesus Christ, we see the visible image of the invisible God. God is love, dead on a cross for you and for your salvation, so that we may not only love God, but we may love brothers, sisters, all. One of the best ways we show our love for one another is when we proclaim that love for one another. Sometimes we do it with actions followed up by words. Sometimes it's words followed up by actions. Parents show the love they have for God by raising their children in the faith. Husbands and wives by bringing one another to church, by forgiving one another. 
We are given to share the love of Jesus with the community. We did so again this week. It's a small thing, but it's a really, really big thing too. Our wooden cross on the top of the roof was showing some wear. Below the roof line, it still looked like the beautiful finished cross that was put up there all those years ago. But now, when you walk by, drive by, you'll have to look before you go home today. That wooden cross is covered with aluminum. I can't wait to see it at night with a beautiful sunset or even in a lightning storm. One of the most endearing comments about the raising of that cross this week showed up on Facebook. It was from a mother. She posted, when I was across the street in the hospital for having one of my children, I saw your church's cross. And it reminded me that Jesus loves me. We love because he first loved us. Never forget that. Jesus loves you. In the name of Jesus, amen. The canticle at morning prayer is the Benedictus, page 238. Please stand.
reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name would be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true preaching and teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn us from all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. In your May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit, according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, especially those who have requested our prayers, including Lucille, Gordon, Nancy, Patricia, Lava, Beverly, Mary, Lisa, Richard, and Clinton. Praying for them at all times. Thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayer. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. That our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you. And that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil, of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Taught by the Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
Be seated. Welcome back, Pastor. Our prayers continue for you. I can report that there will be a change in the governor's order as of tomorrow. Uh, it may be in part with a visit that Governor Gordon had with our district president, Reverend John Hill. Uh, so our elders and church leaders have a lot to talk about this week. We get to chart our own path uh, using some good common sense and the cleaning procedures that we've been employing the last few months. Peace be with you. <laughs> 